Thank you very much. Now I know who I am, and so do you. Uh, my name is Nigel Evans. Uh, I am chair of the uh, EFPA Board of Assessment. Um, I just wanted to say a few words of thanks once again for the whole team at uh, Padua. Um, I can't remember everybody's names, but Sylvia and the whole uh, uh, Padua team, uh, if, it, if it wasn't for them, it wouldn't be possible. And uh, on behalf of the whole board, I thank you for organizing this, this wonderful conference. Um, also, I'd um, like to open up with a few questions. Um, you might be thinking, what is EFPA? What is, what is BOA, Board of Assessment? And um, don't be shy. Um, I didn't know myself until I joined the organization, really what they, what they were and how they formed together in a wonderful, I guess, partnership of psychological associations uh, through in, in Europe. And I just move on here. Um, what I wanted to say is that the Board of Assessment is only one of eight boards eight standard committees and two project groups that is uh, run by EFPA. And that's run on all on behalf of all the associations. So that you see there, there's 37 countries within the, sorry, sorry, I'll go back. Even problems with the tech, here we go. Um, so there's 37 countries and there can be member uh, representatives on all of those particular boards or, or project groups. So boards uh, could be like, like ourselves, board of assessment, board of ethics, for example, standing committees could be um, psychotherapy or organizational psychology and project groups can be something like e-health. So there's specific groups that are attached to those particular projects. We are only one of that, that group. And I guess to help me help you understand EFBA a little bit better, um, I wanted to introduce you to our uh, uh, executive liaison uh, for the Board of Assessment, which is Uli Turon. So Uli, I see if you can come and is there anybody to help me with <laughs> putting Uli in the uh, in the picture? Yeah, the sound test test. Can you hear me, John, Nigel? I can hear you. I can hear you, Uli. That's, you work that's the screen? Hang on. Let me let me see if I can get you. Up here. Just getting a little help to um, see you and uh, see this light as well. Yeah, I'll be, uh, I need to get Ollie into the. Um, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's actually online. No, so he, he's, he's actually on, on he's, he's online. So yes. he maybe one yeah. second. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Oli. There he is. We found you, Ollie. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, do you share? Um, can you share? How do you share the screen? There he is. Fantastic. Okay, Oli, we can we can hear you. Excellent. I I still cannot share my screen, but uh, maybe there is a backup. Just going to do that for you. Should be able now. Now works perfectly. Perfectly. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm sad not to be in Padova for a, a very good, many good reasons. It's a lovely place. And um, it is something artificial about uh, talking to a, a screen. But uh, I first and foremost uh, wish you a very successful conference. Now, uh, Nigel has asked me to say a few words about uh, about uh, the European Federation of Psychologists uh, Association, and I'll uh, try to make that as, uh, as briefly as possible. The, uh, <clears throat> the Federation 
uh, is an umbrella for uh, as much as 37 European member associations throughout Europe, with uh, Cyprus in the southeast, Iceland in the northwest, and has a network of uh, some 350,000 psychologists uh, through its uh, full, full members. Uh, EFPA's activities, we really want to concentrate it on uh, three pillars. It's uh, contributing to society, developing psychology, and serving psychologists. And then there are uh, some chapters for each of these. Uh, the uh, EFPA uh, board also chooses uh, a couple of fields of action for uh, one or two or several terms like uh, the present term, European Year of Mental Health is very much in the focus, and so is climate change. It's impossible to give you the full overview of uh, FPA activities. Um, Nigel introduced the uh, 16 working groups uh, comprising more than 200 uh, European psychologist experts within uh, various uh, and very broad field of uh, disciplines. Uh, just to give you a snapshot of uh, recent months, we had uh, the European Congress under the auspices of EFPA in Brighton uh, this summer. Uh, one of the uh, workshops pre-Congress was increasing equality and access to psychological services with uh, invited guests from uh, all over the world uh, discussing European experiences. Uh, the Board of Assessment uh, has performed a survey on attitudes towards test and testing in Europe and, uh, and uh, published this uh, as late as May uh, this year. Uh, there is an ongoing revision of, of the European test review model that is really a, a solid and very extensive work uh, and uh, it's a revision of the review model that was launched first in 2013. Uh, we tr try to keep up with uh, uh, what's uh, happening in, in uh, present times and there is, a, for instance, a webinar series on potential technology for psychology. We see that uh, technology uh, really um, merges with uh, the science of psychology and uh, a lot of progress is being done on that field. One of the major accomplishments of FPA over the years is the Eurosci certificate. It is a standard of education, professional training and competence in psychology, and it's set by the European Federation of Psychologists Association. Presently, 26 of the FPA full members now offer the Eurosci certificate. This was initially uh, meant as an instrument to uh, ease and uh, promote uh, mobility for the profession within Europe. Uh, as you know, health legislations are, are very diverse in Europe, so that might be in the, in the future, but it really has helped to, uh, to increase uh, attention to what psychology and psychological education and training and practice really is about. So that's one of the... Um, uh, probably one of the, the most important accomplishments of FPA over the, the last uh, two decades when it's been around. So I would just wanted to uh, give you an idea about FPA. Many of you know FPA. Many of you know what uh, these uh, different working groups do. Um, most of, of the working groups and members of the Board of Assessment probably are already present. That's very good. So, with these words, I welcome you to the New Horizons in Psychological Assessment and wish you a wonderful conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Holly.
So, Oli's done a fantastic job of looking at the uh, maybe what's quite uh, appropriate today, F of being called an umbrella organization. Um, what I'd like to do is to focus on board of assessment uh, now. Um, but before doing so, <coughs> just to remind you that there is a wealth of information for all psychologists, be you academic psychologists, practitioner psychologists, very experienced psychologists, new to psychology in the EFTA website. Um, because we do have some very, very significant powers of, if you like, connections of in influence with the work that we do. Many of the uh, initiatives, particularly the strategic ones, are linked with bigger uh, organizations. So, for example, as Ollie said about the mental health at the World Health uh, Organization with, with the United Nations, um, links with uh, big organizations, uh, psychological organizations outside of, of Europe most notably the American Psychological Association, and also influences in government, most uh, particularly that we've been looking at a Board of Assessment with the European Commission. Um, those references and those links and everything are there for you to access at whatever time you, you wish to, uh, whether there's initiatives, conferences, seminars, there's a whole host of things that we've done over the, over the, over the past years, uh, not just in Board of Assessment, but in other boards as well. That, so there's webinars, and they, if they've done a webinar, you can access that webinar or elements of that webinar. Um, also alongside um, abstracts and papers from different conferences as well. There's resource hubs that, that are there, um, some specific things on the pandemic, Ukraine and climate change. And not forgetting that there is a European uh, Journal of Psychology, which is actually um, basically regular and special editions, and that is completely free uh, for access online. So what are our aims? Um, our aims have just always been twofold. The first is to progress standards in testing and assessment, and the other is to increase the visibility of the board of assessment. Those two things do come hand in hand with what we do, because we like to publicize our work, this is one way that we, that, we, that we do it through conferences, um, but there is also a lot of work that's being done in the background as well. So as Ollie said, that the test review model is one of those sort of standard uh, products, if you like, some tools that um, the Board of Assessment has been working on for uh, many years. Uh, we will tell you more about that as, as, we, as we go through into the, into the panel. Um, there are a set of um, test user qualifications that link to what is called a Euro test certificate. So there's levels one, two, and three, which link to um, administration, specific use, and master use of, of tests. And there's a test attitude survey, which um, is run every 10 years. And so we um, basically put that together over the, interesting, over the pandemic period. So it took a little bit longer to do. Um, but we have presented that at various conferences and specific country papers are being written up on that. Um, in terms of visibility, well, here we are and hoping to raise the visibility through I say, sharing information on, from, from websites, but also cooperation with other organisations. And also, uh, as I said, looking at more ways that we can work here. Um, uh, FPA Board of Assessment is a team. Okay, we are a team and we do work together as a team. So just, just as an illustration point here, that we have our um, test review model team, which is a focus team, but we have uh, alongside that team, uh, members of the Dutch um, uh, Association and of COTAN. We have myself who's uh, overseeing that. And obviously Oli is bouncing on in there, um, who's overseeing that in terms of the uh, EC liaison for us. We also stand on the shoulders of people that have gone before us, and we have a reference back to many people um, who've been on the on the on the panel, and we pull on those uh, expertise uh, for uh, updates and assistance. In terms of what we might do at other conferences, so this is one just as an example of what we might do. Uh, this is at the International Test Commission. So um, looking at that in sort of a broader way, that it's not just Europe, it, it, we go further than that. And um, it'd be interesting to know that um, the, the test model, the European test model um, has been uh, used in the uh, Gulf, in Asia, and into Australia as well. So there, it does actually use and, and, uh, and stand the test of time for, for tests and so forth. Um, one of the um, things that we actually responded to is the European Commission and 
if you've um, not been hiding under a rock for the past uh, few months, um, artificial intelligence has become in vogue. We were actually doing that over two years ago, actually responding to the proposal for regulation uh, with artificial intelligence. And we did that in association with um, both the European Test Publishers and uh, the Association of Test Publishers, which is a worldwide group. Um, other things come our way as well, and we respond to those and also try to um, give our input on those, on those areas. Um, so there's artificial intelligence, particularly as it um, affects people's health and education and work uh, focus and work outcomes. Um, and there is a whole lot of things around whether a psychological test is actually a medical device. So um, you may be uh, aware that if you have a paper and pencil test, and I might give it to you, uh, you have the paper and pencil test, that's a, that's a psychological test. Um, but if you digitize it, in the eyes of some people, you have now got a medical device in your hands or in the hands of the patient. Um, again, we respond to that in fairness with um, other uh, psychological associations to obviously make sure that we feel that we are uh, very psychological rather than medical in our approach. And we also work with uh, other congresses, so a specific one there uh, with the um, work uh, application. So I always say that um, on the board of assessment, we should be agnostic. That is to say that uh, we look at work, we look at education, we look at health, um, but sometimes we actually focus on uh, a, a, a symposia on particular areas. That one there was actually on these test surveys that we've done um, as applied to work and organizational psychology. Um, here we are. Well, there's a few of us anyway, and you might know some faces when they get up in a moment to uh, uh, be a, a, amongst us on the panel. Um, but you know, for information, for documentation, and for representation, um, go and have a look at the FPO uh, working groups uh, site of, of assessment. Um, we do welcome people from all areas, and we are one of the largest of the representatives of the, of the groups. But we still um, have people missing from different countries. Um, if you feel that you want representation, then please link up with us, and we can we can do that for you. So with that. I want to just check in with the group. Is there any questions before we go into a panel? Any questions that can come forward? Not yet? Okay, that's where we've got the panel. So I would like to bring up my colleagues. Not all of them can unfortunately make it and um, not all of them can actually fit on the stage <laughs> here, but if um, my colleagues would like to come up now and we can, I think we have name badges as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we might have to uh, move the mic as we go along uh, on this area. I think we've got just about enough there. Thank you. Thank, thank you for that. We just about fit on the screen and fit on the stage um, for us here. So um, I'd like to introduce um, uh, my colleagues uh, that we have around, around the room here. Um, you've already met <laughs> and know Adriana. <laughs> okay. Um, so that is Mark. Uh, Anna. <laughs> okay. Ursula. Dushka. And I'm afraid uh, Astrid unfortunately cannot be with us at uh, short notice. Uh, she sends her uh, best wishes and um, hopes to be with us at the next uh, uh, conference we have. So we did have a few questions or thoughts around. Um, 
And as I say, the, we hope we've sort of just shared with you very briefly some of the work that we do. Um, but the panel is here to, if you like, to expand that a little bit and to answer any questions that you might have and any burning thoughts or, or, or issues that, that, might be, that might be sort of provoked by some of the work that we do. And the, oops, hello, you like to move that. Um, so the topics that we thought would be, would be useful as the, uh, one is the test review model. Uh, the second is user standards. Third is the European survey of test attitudes. And we've actually done that um, study uh, in over 20 countries in Europe. Um, lobbying government and the, all the sort of ideas of digitization, AI, tech, those sorts of things as, a, as applied to testing. So I thought I might be a bit pointed to start with <laughs> in, terms of, in terms of questions, because some people have, uh, are, are, and the panel have been more focused or at least leading and heading up some of these areas than others. And um, I look uh, to my immediate right here um, as, the, uh, as the person that's been doing a lot of work, or at least uh, uh, focusing our, our work on the test review model. So Mark, would you like to just tell us a little bit about test review model, where it was and where it's at? Okay. Um, good afternoon. Where would I start? Maybe history. Eh? The model started already in the years 90, 90 so the previous uh, century. So in 2002, it was the first version, so it's more than 20 years old. And it's sometimes contradictory how it's used. Eh? Uh, I always feel uh, people who like it, eh? it's, uh, for me, the central thing is quality. Eh? If you talk about test review model and all, all the things around it, it's quality, quality of the material you work with. Eh? And there are different ways of looking at quality. And there's always a context. Eh? You can say the instrument I use might be not okay if I use this model. I know that one. So we are not saying this is the only truth out there, but it is a truth for certain instruments in certain contexts. So quality, I want to come back to that. Quality is in, in the strict way is a psychometric thing. So we are talking here about three basic things. That's norms, yeah, norms, reliability, and validity. And that's something that's been always looked at from a certain, maybe too academic way. I hope we to review now, and it's 10 years ago that we changed. It's 10 years ago, 2013. I should be ashamed. We should be ashamed that a model of 2013 is still used. So we, I can maybe say we, we were thinking about already five years about changing. So now finally, we are there. We are six months on our way, six months. And in one year, finally, we hope to get a new, bigger, uh, especially the, the new things, and gamification or the digital things in it, but also, I hope, le less strict academic. Yeah? I, I am an academic, but I'm trying to get it more open. And so don't see it as a, as a Bible. Yeah? That's the only book where you can read what's really the good thing and what happened. No, we hope it will be a guide, yeah? a guide for you in your situation, if you want to look at, and I come back to that one word, quality. Can I say some good things about my instrument I use or I work with, but also, and um, it's for me a question of strength and weaknesses. Right? It's, it's, you, you need to know you use, let's say the number one in the world is the WISC, yeah? Wexler Intelligence Scale. Even that one, I worked along with it. I know a lot of weaknesses of the number one. And I think it's important for the users, for the test publishers also, to know weaknesses and strength and try to get those weaknesses away 
as possible, but sometimes it's not possible. So that's for me the, the general thing about the test review model. Eh? It's used in a lot of countries. Uh, it was born, you know, in Spain, eh? Spain, in Britain, and in the Netherlands. That were in the 19th, I see the start. So quality, strength, and weaknesses. And in one year, you have a new uh, thing to, to have a look at for you, for your publishers, and so on. That's my view on the test review model. Maybe it's already time for somebody of the team to, to say something more or less about it, or? Sure. I mean, I think, um, it, as, you, as you were saying, Mark, that um, it, was, it was born of a, you know, three countries sort of pulling together and understanding it to make it a sort of more of a universal model for, as I said, it's for Europe, but it can, it has been applied uh, outside Europe there. Um, I'm just interested, uh, perhaps from Anna, in terms of what's been happening sort of in Spain in that, in a sense, for, especially on the on the side of it, because, um, you know, Spanish speaking tests are pretty large in the world. Yeah. Uh, well, I think I can Thank you. Um, well, I mean, the Spanish model is true that is taken, I mean, it's, it comes from the EFPA model and, and it, it's a little bit uh, shorter, I would say. Um, and it's true it's taken as a model in many uh, countries in Latin America, uh, such as, I don't know, Colombia and also uh, Chile, they are using this model to to also apply their tests, even if they also make some changes when, when uh, proposing their own models. And um, we have been, I mean, the model was proposed in 2000 and, and it was there for, for a while until uh, we started to really apply it and, and administer it to tests and then publish the, the test reviews. And since then, it has been uh, administered every single year. I mean, we go step by step because uh, the number of, of tests we review every year is small, it's around 10. But eventually, I mean, we have been out there for 10 years, so we are increasing uh, the number. And I think uh, it's having a, a very positive influence, especially in the way uh, publishers present now their manuals, because they take this model really as a guide. And so they want to fit it all the criteria. So they want to provide evidence about differential item functioning or about the content validity or about all sources of reliability. So it's like uh, they don't want to leave anything blank. So I, I think that's a, a, a good consequence of the model. And um, of course, for test users, I mean, it's also an interesting tool in order to make a decision whether they should uh, choose a test or not. I think for the next uh, version of the model, the FPA model, we need to think of uh, whether there, there are some particularities because sometimes we assess a test and a test can be used for different purposes and different purposes can make us be more or less exigent or ask for more or less criteria to be satisfied. So this is something we, we need to think of. But um, in general, I think uh, people that know uh, that these uh, reports about test uh, quality are out there, they are reading them and using them to, to make the decision. And the drawback is that not many people, this in the, in the survey we, we run, not many people know about this action. So this is why we still need to work on disseminating and, and uh, making uh, this known for, for everybody. Sure. Thank you, Anna. And I think that sort of just gives us a, an idea that um, it, if you like, you can use the model in a very official way, in the sense that a psychological association uh, or, or accreditation body can use the model to look at that and give an official mark <laughs> on it, um, as well as for users uh, or um, people may perhaps be buying particular tests for their organization, their institution, whether it be a hospital, whether it be a school, whether it be a business, is they can use the, that model for themselves to have a look at the criteria. Mm -hmm. And it's a very positive impact that um, people are changing the way that they actually present information. 
um, because you know, many years ago when I started training people on tests, <laughs> you used to say, well, find where the reliability is. And you'd have to look at, was it three or four different chapters to sort of pull all the elements together? And that's actually the publisher who should be knowing what they're doing, actually, yeah. having that. So now it's coming together to be much more clearer and almost like, almost like a sort of certification itself to focus on that. Good. I'd like to just throw some questions or thoughts out to the audience as we, as we, as we have there. Um, anybody like any questions or clarifications on what we talked about on the test review model, how it might be applied, how you might use it? Yeah. Is there a book? I'm sorry, a book? Is there oh. a book? There's no book. The model is now online. And you can at our website and on different places. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sir. Uh, I, I was curious about did you, so did you, let's say, uh, rank uh, or uh, Assess uh, the uh, repositories of tests for uh, publishers uh, in, uh, I don't know, in Italy. We have three main publishing houses. Uh, is there data on the quality of the tests that they sell abroad? Maybe I can, model, uh, I can talk for, for my country. If we look, for example, at intelligence tests, I know those things very well. There are more than 30, 30 intelligence tests used in Belgium, and there are only one out of four that are okay. And we give to the users, you it's better with you know, this, in this situation, to use this, this, this. This is a, a quality issue. But it's, for me also, if you just look at the instrument and psychometrics, then you're very, you are, it's very hard and it will be a minority who create who just has the the qualities you need you know? so that's a, when we when we use this review model just like that hard then it's a minority who is okay i think that's a serious message but for the people who work with instruments i think it might be interesting it's not the law but we say that's for, once again, so we talk about the risk, but it's the number one of 500 instruments that we've looked at, there are about 500 instruments used every day, 500, and only one out of four is okay. And then we say the risk, okay, but look at that and that. The WIPC, okay, then look at that and that. And beware if you use test leaks, because uh, for little children, that's not so good. Beware for that, because using that in a context of cultural things, there is no cultural information about that test. So I see it like that, like a, not a real, we do it sometimes, A, B, C, D, E, and we put the tests over there. But it can be sometimes, what is the English word, too hard? Too, too harsh, yeah, too, hard. Eh? too harsh eh? to, to say, but if you, yeah, that's for me the, the the quality issue is uh, put more information about the, the strength and weaknesses is much more interesting than say all the C and the D's and the E's throw mm -hmm. them away. Does that is a little bit the answer for your question or were you thinking about something else? Uh, thank you for the answer. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this, just to um, clarify as well that um, certain countries, um, Spain, <laughs> uh, UK, Norway, um, Poland, I believe. <laughs> no, not, not yet, not yet, <laughs> not, not yet, not yet. So, um, in terms of in terms of the publications, if you like, that um, certain um, psychological associations that I mentioned, um, and actually accreditation. Um, um, uh, certification groups do actually publish those reviews so it's not just a yes no or a, even a one to five scale it is actually um both a quantitative as well as qualitative appraisal of the instrument so uh, for example i can only speak for myself in terms of looking at it but in terms of the british psychological society um we've been running 
things, I think since 1990, looking at looking at tests and so forth. And um, you know, those reviews are actually online to have a look out there. So there's a very small part of review. And if you want to, if you're a member, you can actually go in for, for, for the more, more detail on that. Okay, so, it's, so there are, they are in existence, but they would be country specific. Okay. Maybe I can just add, it's also interesting for work, who works every day. It's kind of informative eh, to know that there are alternatives if you used, and it's a very human thing, but we saw it a lot of times when you are used to work with instrument X, it's not easy to change eh, even for, and, and then you can see there's also other instruments with good and bad things, but I think it's also uh, something from that model, a consequence. Okay, we were talking about the user, and I think I'd like to go on to the user standards. And um, uh, I think Ula, you you've been doing quite a bit in Holland with user standards. Tell us a little bit about uh, that uh, history. Yeah, I represent Polish Psychological Association, and from that perspective, I can add that. Um, when you would like to implement test review model or test user standards, the local perspective is very important to, to do that actually, because we as board of assessment, we can deliver only general standards and general uh, rules, how to see the quality of tests or how to perceive the competent test user, but you as a National Association of Psychologists need to adapt this to your local perspective. For example, from our Polish perspective, we do not have any um, formal register for psychologists, um, actually no regulation how to assess competence amongst um, non-psychologists and psychologists who would like to apply tests in their everyday practice. So this kind of standards like FPA standards help you granulate professional um, diagnostic competence and directly decide how competent and what scope of knowledge and what skill and what kind of ethical attitudes should acquire every test user on every of our three levels. We have level for expert psychologist, for competent test user, this is the second level, and first one is for the assistant that can help psychologist or a test user to move their work smoothly, or something like that. It's kind of assistant to, to, to help in testing. So this is something that you can gain um, when you decide to implement uh, test user standards for your country. But the policy that you have um, within your country will direct you to the point how actually you can do this. Our job as Board of Assessment is to disseminate this idea to support uh, test review model because having test user standards, you can decide who can um, actually use and apply uh, each and every test. So this is some kind of triangle actually. Uh, one, uh, one point of this triangle would be for test uh, review model, a second one for test user standards, and the third one, um, at least in work and organizational setting, were for, was for ISO standards. So this triangle will help you to establish the procedure to see the testing procedure in full. So this is actually first steps that you need to follow to have this as a whole. The, the, this is more or less the the perspective that we as a board of assessment share to support test users um, within the European countries and we'll be happy to share our knowledge from the local perspective as my country from Poland, I will be happy to serve you if you have any questions and of course we have PDFs documents on our website to Doland if you would be interested how this model looks in details. Thank you. Yusuka, would you like to say how things have been moving in, in your area? Slovenia. Yeah, you know, Slovenia is a very small country. We have uh, two associations. One of them is, as I'm representative of it, is only, it has only 200 members, so we are very small. And we are now are very, perhaps these four points, lobbying 
for uh, to have in Slovenia laws uh, for psychological um, activities or how to say psychological practice. practice. Yes, I think from nineties. So um, we very useful is this European survey of test attitudes. We can see how psychologists see the um, the the test use in Slovenia, and um, the they see that, for instance, copyright. They are not. They are not. Um, uh, how to say? Uh, no, they are uh, free, from not, uh, not copyright. Yeah. Not copyright. Yeah, no, they are um, cop they copying copies, copies uh, the tests, for yeah, instance. Copying. Yeah, tests. or we have really um, bad situation with that that you can buy any foreign tests anywhere. Yeah and translate it without permission, without authorization. So we are really fight for this law or for, you know, to have some regulation about that. And all these <laughs> information documents are very helpful for to, to, um, to say the government, what is the situation in Slovenia. So perhaps that is more than survey of test attitudes sure information and, and i suppose then um what we're looking at there uh, is the, the, each country because there's like 37 countries in in the EFPA umbrella so everybody can benefit from the work that's being done you know, whether it's a big country or a, a smaller country whether they're advanced in psychometrics or assessment or or not there is the benefit there is, is out there for everybody to actually access if they wish um, mm -hmm. and can you tell us a little bit more about so i'm curious about what you actually found in the surveys that you that you, you did oh it's difficult to generalize the information because you know the samples are different and we we don't know you know who is inside or um Yeah, so in clinical field, the situation is worse um, every 10 years, uh, especially for this, um, how they use uh, tests. Yeah, so that's, but you can't generalize everything. That's, yeah, yeah. Um, any, anybody else on the panel just like to say about their surveys? And just perhaps to link the test user standard with the European survey. Um, I think one interesting thing in the in the survey is that we we also ask about about whether psychologists would be pro uh, um, more pro moving uh, um, like a certification for test users. Mm -hmm. And for example. Uh, because I, I have been participating with with Zula in the standards for test users, but then, for example, in Spain, it's like it wouldn't work because we don't have a tradition of certification first and 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 for professionals, and because it could be in our society kind of crazy to uh, as psychologists to do something else to certify because supposedly they have the skills, the knowledge to use this. So uh, it's like this. The Spanish uh, Association of Psychology uh, thinks that asking for more certification would be too much. And on the other hand, in some countries, people that are non psychologists can be certified to use tests. But in Spain, we are not pro uh, uh, doing that because um, 
Uh, it's more in the idea that only uh, psychologists should use psychological tests. And uh, that also has problems because we know that some non-psychologists are using psychological tests because, I mean, there is no big regulation about who can buy the test or not. Supposedly, the test houses take care of that, but of course, somebody else can give the test. Or... So uh, I think it's, it's uh, something uh, very important, this, this survey, when deciding if we implement some actions or not, because if they are not going to be successful in the end, it's like, um, no seems so. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Okay. Just uh, a few words about uh, Italy, because uh, as you know, Italy has a very strict law about uh, psychologists and uh, don't know, an ethical also profession and a sanitary profession. So uh, it is very difficult, in my opinion, to say how testing is using or not using in Italy, because, uh, you know, on the one hand, to get the test model would be wonderful, but to get this, you need to get a committee that is anywhere, no? Consulting, and it's not so easy to put together all Italian contribution about testing about that. And the Spanish is very lucky because you can pay supervisor, you can pay psychologist that uh, get this specific test uh, to evaluate what is happening. So this is a big, big wish for Italian people to get that one. The second thing is that you know. Our, we are, we get a very strict ethical code about how we are using psychological, any kind of psychological tool. But who is really controlling how much this coding ethical is taken into account from testing, from the beginning to the evaluation, to the application? And for me, you know, when I was the first time at the board, no, and there was the different standard, you know, they are implicit in our role, but there they are explicit, you know. So there is this first level, second level, third level, and I think that we need more about that, about also Italian use of psychology or testing and what is happening. Because I think that what is happening is really between individual ethical standard and training. And this is very, a very big topic, I think. Thank you. Because um, I, 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 I think if I, if I was to take a guess, we have uh, more uh, uh, people from Italy here in the room than, than, than others. Um, so it, I would be interested, I think we would be interested to know like, the, the, you know, the thoughts of yourselves of test standards being, is it a good thing? Is it a good thing to, that psychologists need to actually be aware and up their game of what you need to do with tests? You know, is clinical training actually clinical training that looks very specifically at clinical tests yeah, and, and, and actually in the user way, yeah? Um, is there some kind of um, allowance for non-psychologists to be using tests? And what those, would those allowances be? Where would they be? How would they become? Yeah? It's because in other countries, including the UK in a sense, that there, there, there are test registers and test registers, there are probably you know, equal amounts of non-psychologists on there as psychologists, for example, in the work psychology field. So I think it's quite interesting that we have standards, okay, and it's how they are applied in the different countries. So I can say from the UK, as I said, Anna said from Spain and, and Andrea and Rana said from, 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 from Italy. So just curious about any thoughts or reactions from those um, ideas that we put forward. 
uh, I'm from France, from Kenya. Uh, and in France, um, 10 years ago, we, we, we created a charter. We proposed to the pest hunter to sign a charter uh, and then um, undertook to follow the guidelines of the International Pest Commission uh, to their practice. And uh, it was a, a, a good way to, to improve the quality of the practice of the pest and uh, try to clean up, clean up the the market, the test market, right? Mm -hmm. But um, some of them seen, but uh, a lot of them didn't. And uh, so it's. I'm, so I'm sorry, you said about cleaning up the, the test market. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Could you, could you, it's interesting, elaborate a little bit more on what that what that looked like? Yes, we can say that of bad practice. Sorry. <laughs> Louder. Yes. Yeah. And. Um, and today we we think that uh, maybe the, the best uh, way to, to improve the quality of practice of our test is to create a, a, a quality level mm -hmm. uh, on for each test and not for editors for each test. And um, what do we think about that? Well, that we wonder if this would be a good way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so basically, just to so say that just to, just to recap, because I don't know if everybody <laughs> heard, 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 heard fully that um, the, when a French association yeah. Yeah, um, clarified a little bit more about what was looking for in a good test and that effectively cleaned up the market, <laughs> as, it, as, it, as it were, um, and to go so far as to say that would the um, standard, if you like, that is a breach, would that actually be like a, a stamp of approval, a, a quality mark yes. or a kite mark or something like, like that? Okay, that's an interesting interesting point there. Um, just back to the panel in different countries, <laughs> is, does anything like that exist at the moment? I think for yourself. I already said that. In Belgium, it's existing for a lot of tests. But I know there's also a lot of contradiction about it. Uh, and I agree with, you just need to put more context around it. Mm -hmm. uh, the most important for me is for what purpose do you use this test? There are a lot of tests that are not so well psychometrically, but which are good in a certain situation. And it's, the man, it's depending on the purpose and how far are you making conclusion of it. When my child has to be tested and it's about getting the kind of education to A or to B, that's for me an important decision. And if you then use a test, which I say crazy to use it, that's not to do. So just we have with colors even, lists with red and orange and yellow and green, but you need a little text about it too. Also new for me, the word didn't fall so far, is fairness. Also a lot of instruments, good instruments, are not good in ways of fairness. Because I, my specialty is also about cultural bias. And there's a lot of good instruments, even the whisks from this world, who made major mistakes, unforgivable, about giving this results that are totally wrong just because you use an instrument in that context with that child. Yeah, and we have a lot of, so it's a little bit for me, yes, you can make a stamp on it, but uh, tell also about context, purpose, fairness, and don't throw it away with that, but uh, just say it's not, I'm gonna use that word again, the Bible, the one and only right thing, this is it. But there are instruments also in Belgium that I know that should not be used. Yes, but uh, a bad instrument will not never be a good instrument. The what? A bad instrument never be. Yeah, uh, but that's for me minority. There are some instruments that make it very concrete. For me, on personality, for example, there are a lot of projective tests and that will be not okay with our review model. But I would prefer a kind of project, projective test to test my child when it has been abused. Mm -hmm. And I cannot use the traditional, very scientific, neo, neo, 
you know, the new, uh, uh, that kind of thing. I'm going to ask about personality, but, and you have a clinical interview, perfect clinical interviews to, to measure personality. But the context of, let's take that abuse, makes that sometimes you need other instruments. And so that's for me the relative thing about it. I'm pro quality, but in a context and on a purpose. So please add also some information about that. And maybe one last, and that's for example, the risk. Sorry, I, I worked three years on it. The risk is for me okay now, but not to use in a digital way. So that's not fairness, that's not context, that's the way you take it. Huh? Like Pearson is now promoting in our country, use the digital thing. I can, I will tell tomorrow, there's more than 10 to 15 IQ points going into the air because you use two, two screens instead of the paper and pencil thing. So that's also a context. Huh? That's how did you take your test of that child? Okay, that's enough. Yeah, yeah. I just uh, want to say that don't forget also for the competencies of psychologists with good tests and uh, not competent psychologists, you can have nothing. <laughs> so I think that that was also the reason that we started with this test user standards because you have to have everything, not not just tests, not just a label of tests or something like this. Yeah. If I may, I just about test users, I can say that in Belgium, we did not, we did not, it was not possible so far to make a kind of uh, three levels, eh? because there's a lot of contestation, a lot of unhappiness, and why? Because there are a lot of different educations, eh? master, bachelor, professional bachelor, then I have, for example, I have 10 years experience, he only has one, so there's a big matrix with what did you study, how much experience do you have, and then the other thing is, what do you do with the test? Take it, make interpretation, make decision on it. So that's a matrix from five, six, seven different things about what is using a test, what is that? And then what are you, what can you, and so ever. And so we only in Belgium for the moment, it's just we arguing. We, we cannot say the, it's mainly I can say the professional bachelors who just take the test, here, take your risk, you take your risk, yeah. And I'll make the, I'm the master, I will make interpretation, but it's much more complex than this. And there's unhappiness about who knows the most of standardization, about interpretation, about making the choice of the test, about writing a report. That's all very difficult to say. So we made a kind of proposal and I, I can say it's just, arguing, arguing, arguing. So we don't have the one, two, three level, we have 17 levels to the board. <laughs> and, but that, you cannot work with it. Eh? You are level 10 years of education, sorry that I'll point to you, 10 years uh, experience. You have a master, but not in psychology. For example, when he, in England, not psychologist working with certain tests, the little hair that's here just comes rise like that. Eh? So that's, in Belgium, not thinkable about a non-psychologist working with psychological tests. They are thinking, but with us, that's uh, that's a crime. Mm -hmm. So very different, I think, in the different countries. I can add to this that the idea that stands behind the test user standards is very inclusive. Every of these three levels uh, is open to psychologists as well as at non-psychologists. And this is, um, at least at now, non-acceptable non for Euro European countries. So this is something that we are actually struggling about 
uh, when trying to implement test user standards. It's not about standards, but it is about um, who can be a competent test users and how to safeguard the fire for psychologists. And actually, this is a big question if based on the competence model, uh, psychologists can be at the same level as non-psychologists when using tests. This is the question that should be raised. And when trying to implement standard, you, you as every single country will be forced to answer this actually dilemma, I would say. So this is something very important about test user standards. <laughs> it is anyway, no. Uh, initially, the law says that the testing are for psychologists, but you know, sometimes law of it is, or you know, or you will, uh, some uh, uh, teachers and so on teaches best. The problem who is uh, interpreting and use them then, and how much of this, you know how much you open or not. But surely when you go to the interpretation or lecture of result, it's done by psychologists. Yeah, so it's, uh, this is very strict about that, but <laughs> not so easy anyway. <laughs> yeah. My favorite to add something to what Adriana was saying. Yeah. So in Italy, we have a very strict uh, ethical code. And uh, um, in those days from yesterday, from to tomorrow, we are voting a new uh, strict strict way to uh, detect all the codes in the code, the ethical code for psychologists. So in Italy, the reality is that not just psychologists applied and used and administered test, but theoretically, just psychologists after the five years of uh, university uh, can apply and interpret tests, in particular, clinical tests. Uh, we have also, uh, at the bachelor degree, students cannot administer any kind of test, nor uh, clinical, of course, but also they cannot apply, for example, just um, for about, uh, uh, um, characteristics, for example, in uh, uh, work psychology and so on, leadership and so on, which are not cl specifically clinical dimensions. And they can just administer after the bachelor degree, but not profiling and not interpreting and not uh, give back to, for example, people that ask for the test. So the law is very strict and uh, uh, we are trying in the last uh, period with the, this last version of the ethical code to, uh, to keep the testing and the assessment with the tools and models just for psychologists. It's not so simple, of course. And uh, also when you are, um, when you are able, you are, you are a psychologist, many tests pretend uh, rightly to have like a, um, a degree or something to apply them. For example, projective tests are not for just psychologists. You have to make a long training to use them. And there are lists of trainees that are able to train. They, they have, they, they gain the availability to testing, but uh, instead that they cannot use the test. So I think it's very important that we in some way defend level of expertise and level of competencies in the psychology fields, uh, keeping attention that other kind of professional, which we are working in, in the equipe, for example, which is a good uh, practice, they are not psychologists, and uh, we have to make our own piece of work and then collaborate in an equip uh, structure. Okay, this the chat and this as a reaction over there. 
do the reaction first and then look at the chat. <laughs> I think that uh, it doesn't really still uh, it's a fight that's worth fighting. Uh, still, I uh, was a, a more cynical part. Uh, and I don't think that uh, thinking in terms of categories of professionals uh, is going, ever going to be effective because there is so much variety within psychologists. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are not a, a single breed. We <laughs> take two different psychologists. One is a psychoanalyst, uh, the other one is cognitive behavioral. So, so how can you think that they are, they are they do the same thing? They, they don't. We don't. So I think that it's good to fight for uh, restraining uh, other professionals from using our tools, but I don't think that this will really make the difference. It has to be more contextual, I think, and more in-depth and more uh, qualitative uh, assessment of individuals doing things. And, uh, and I, 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 I might be overly pessimistic. <laughs> the, the chat didn't have a question. I didn't think it was on that side. Um, I think um, just to sort of overlay what you could see from the test standards, yeah, because I think absolutely there's there's a many different <laughs> many different things in many different categories, many different matrices you could you could work at, yeah, but the so it, there is something about a simplification just to understand levels yeah so regardless of whether you feel that a test could be used by someone else or not it's a quite it's good check on the rubric yeah so level one administration yeah that, that, that's that's it that's you know, that's the rest quotes restriction yeah level, you know uh, administration only yeah. Level two, test user. Yeah. So there's test user. And sometimes in some areas, particularly say the UK, that may be very specific on test user ability tests in work psychology. Yeah. And so you can so you see where, the, where you can start to sort of try and look at levels and where they might be. And level three is expert. Yeah. So level three is very much what you're saying, that the expert is like saying this person is totally responsible for the assessment. Yeah, the, you know, it stops with them. If something goes wrong <laughs> with the assessment, they are the expert. They should know better in that way. So, that, so I'm just sort of getting a, an idea, as you like it. Although things can be complex, it does just help to have a sort of like a structure along the lines there. Um, at the moment in the UK, um, there is a very clear um, uh, um, um, adaptation, if you like, for work psychology. Yeah. So in that sense, that, that um, people um, that are using ability tests, personality questionnaires, whatever they might 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 have there, they they're not needing to be the expert in understanding what the heck is behind. Them. This thing, <laughs> okay, in 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 one in one sense, in, in, like because the the idea here is the fact that they have specially trained on that particular personality questionnaire, as well as having the information behind it to say how that that should be fed back, used, written up, and, and so forth. So I'm just wanting to say that that. that it's not like letting people use things just for that <laughs> yeah, and, and, and out. It's trying to be very clear about those those areas. Um, when you go to other areas, um, you can see that there is some interest there. Education, for example, in schools, that teachers using tests of some level. Yeah, and we're not saying like whisk or waste necessarily, but there are certain tests that are used with children on a sort of a quote to lower level that is useful on that area and the same thing in health yeah administration for health that actually frees up the psychologist to do more of the proper stuff if you like the therapy or the analysis and so forth so there are ways and means of using the model that we found anyway in the UK that has been has been practical and, and, and accepted in the way uh, 
uh, I agree with uh, Silvia and uh, Adriana, but there are also other points of view where they interact with uh, the test user standard because uh, some tests are easy uh, to apply and some tests are very difficult uh, to apply. And uh, some tests present a clear abstraction. So the, uh, the administration is easy for uh, trained and not trained uh, person. In other cases, the administration is very difficult. So there are uh, different forms uh, that interact from uh, administration, scoring, and uh, interpretation, and depends on the study uh, education uh, and um, experience of the teachers. Uh, finally, uh, it's part of the, um, the strict application of the ethical code, but uh, there are two points of view, more than two points of view. One is the ethical code with some restriction, and the other is the uh, open science. Mm -hmm. Open science has uh, the negative effect that is uh, open, open to all. And is there uh, Okay, it's easy because uh, all the psychologists do the, um, the, the test easily. It's a simple question of download, print, uh, use. But uh, on the other side, uh, it's the same for uh, all. Simple. And there is no uh, easy solution such as a regularization of uh, interpretation and uh, um, of the results in, uh, in the context of. Uh, I agree. I totally agree. This open science, open uh, public domain questionnaire tests are seen. I think it's very negative for psychology. Um, they are very useful, but you don't have a manual, you don't have, everybody can change something. And I think my experience that it's not not very good. Yeah, just <laughs> my, my, oh, my personal experience. <laughs> I don't, I think that the, the responsibility of everybody here is to train people, to educate yeah. people, to yeah. really be ethical when they are using a test, when they choose a test, when they are changing items that yeah. can have consequences yeah. on the people yeah. they are going to assess. So I think that more than open access or or more regularization, I mean, I think our challenge or our, yeah, that the thing we really need to work on is, is on educating people about, uh, yeah, the consequences that can have for the people we are assessing when we are changing tests because we think that we change a couple of items mm -hmm. and it's going to be fine and mm -hmm. perhaps yeah. nothing happens but we don't know so yeah, it's like, yeah. yeah. So, Anna and uh, uh, yeah. are, uh, you know, are really I think putting the something about roots about how much uh, our psychologists know about testing sometimes and about you know what is really a testing and uh, uh, how much it is easy, you know? Uh, you get the translation, you just change, you don't look at uh, what is uh, the famous variability, what is the concept, what is happening, and uh, uh, how much it is to dedicate to work about testing and uh, how much you need education about it uh, at every level, I think, you know? In, uh, uh, the law can be stricter or not be low as it is in Italy, but, uh, you know, I think that uh, we need to learn really very much. And uh, now maybe we go, uh, it is finished maybe the time, I don't know, but uh, in Italy, but I think that everywhere, you know, sometimes all the basic, you know, uh, of the statistic of uh, testing, are doing, do we you know, with people that really are not able, I think, uh, to communicate. Many of the things are about statistics, about formula, about, uh, but not what is the meaning inside, you know, this specific thing, uh, and how much you are able with, uh, you know, our psychologists to understand what is the testing.
and that probably has also to do with the complexity of some of yeah. the manuals because sometimes yeah. i mean yes, it's sir. nice yeah. that yeah. test houses and psychometricians try to do yeah. these complex things but then the reader in the end is like okay if it has been published must be good because i mean I do this. <laughs> sometimes and this is why the test review model is good because it tries somebody's expert is going to be reading those things to in the end conclude about whether it's good for a specific purpose yeah. or, or not yeah. but uh yeah we need to to work i mean i think it, they are very good tools but still a lot of work to do to improve the implementation and the tools themselves and this is why we are here i guess <laughs> I think that also the important question is how high is the stake when you do testing? Um, we have a tradition to divide tests into two categories, scientific one and um, this for diagnostic purposes. And um, we do not have a general regulation act about uh, psychologist profession, but we have few about how to assess fitness to drive or who should be able to acquire a firearm licenses, for example. And for that purposes, psychologist is totally responsible for test choice. So it is actually inappropriate to, to pick a tests from open science access. They should be restricted somehow to safeguard this decision about somebody's lives. And so this is this is a question that's switched actually the level of your responsibility as a test user. So maybe this could help somehow. I think, um, yeah, uh, just to sort of try and to just finish, uh, wrap up in a, in a, in a moment on this, there, there, is, there is a a point to all this about risk. <laughs> okay, so it's risk for the professional, <laughs> yeah, in that sense, but it's, it's risk for the client, yeah. So it's almost like what are the consequences to the client, the customer, whatever you want to call them from that way. And um, colleagues in Norway, for example, have made quite strong inroads, and this is the link with lobbying government, yeah, when they're, if you, if you sort of just talk about tests, it can seem a little bit okay, up in the air, okay, well, you know, Psychologists are arguing themselves about the tests and what, what's a good test, what's not a good test, who should have a test, all that sort of stuff. But it actually goes and misses the point of what those tests might be used for and how the consequences, good or bad, happen with not using the right test, not using the test properly, and so forth. So, there, um, particularly in schools and also in health, they've got some um, very clear guidelines towards legislation because of the consequences for example child protection yeah child welfare yeah if you focus the risk area or focus the need area there then the test choice the test use the test consequences follow that yeah it's what are you really looking at and what are you what are you what are you working with on that side and so i know we've got a few minutes left there. The last, very last thing and thought I would like to leave you with is that um, have a think in the future, yeah? The future is tomorrow <laughs> with, with, some of, with some of the work that we've been doing on digitalization, on AI, on tech, yeah? In the sense that, you know, I'm talking and working with publishers now who are not gonna publish a manual. Yeah, they're not gonna give you norms. They're not going to give you a scoring key, yeah. because it's all end-to-end -end process, yeah. and it's that sort of area, if you like, to say, well, you know, really, what are we getting at here? You know, what's in sometimes the black box <laughs> yeah, that it, it's here, and how could we review a test that doesn't have that information? How could we review somebody's competence if they're not even really administrating it or scoring it, or even Putting it together to make a judgment on someone because it's all done for you. So some of those those things will be worked on tomorrow with some of the work that we're doing uh, on that area. Um, I think just due to time, I'd like to thank the panel for their contributions there. 
I'd like to thank yourselves for your contributions. And it's very interesting what you're doing and what you're thinking about in the areas like that. And please, if there are any questions or any clarifications, um, very happy we'll be around over the, over the conference. You've got the site information, you can detail that, you can have a look for yourself at some of the work that we've been doing, and, and it does continue. So the EFPA has a two-year rolling sort of process, if you like. And be very pleased to say that um, the team worked very, very hard uh, last uh, last two years, the two years there, and we um, actually met three uh, priority areas. That's each of those areas that we were expected to, you know, average hit one, if not one and a half. So we've actually done very, very well. I think we should give ourselves a round of applause for that. Everyone's around for yourselves. <laughs> Coffee break. It's coffee. It's okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, this is one of my students there. I'm like, talk to you all. There is a favor 